So today is a very big day for AMD. Uh, as well as launching its new CPUs and motherboards, we have two new Navi cards to compete with Nvidia at the high end of the GPU market. So we brought you the first half of that story on Tuesday, and today we can bring you reviews of the new Radeon RX 5700 XT and the Radeon RX 5700. Now we're going to look at the specifications and the cards themselves, but I can just say the good news is that these are actually looking really competitive, so it's a bit more exciting at the high end of the GPU market, uh, and it's about time. Now, as I'm sure you're probably aware, both of these cards are using AMD's new Navi architecture, and this really is uh, a big change from the previous one known as GCN. They're now switching to something called RDNA, uh, Radeon DNA. Now, this, this involves a lot of low-level changes. So, for example, they have redesigned the compute units completely, reorganized them on the chip, and there's a new cache hierarchy and everything. Now, we're going to be detailing that on the website. It's a little bit complicated to go through now, but the upshot from AMD, they're saying that they've been able to achieve a 1.25x increase in uh, performance per clock and a 1.5x gain in efficiency. And these are two areas that they've been really struggling in, so this should translate into some good real-world performance. Both cards are also the first ones to launch with PCI Gen 4. Now, the important thing really for a consumer to know is that you don't need to have a PCIe Gen 4 motherboard to support them. Gen 3 will work fine. Now, Gen 4 doubles the bandwidth available to the cards, but bandwidth along the PCIe bus is not really a limiting factor in today's GPU world, so we're not expecting to see much performance gains, if any, from that being a feature, but it's there and it's always good to see new technology come through. Where you will actually see a gain on PCI Gen 4 uh, is with SSDs. Then there's a new bunch of uh, PCIe 4 SSDs that have come out and these will be compatible with the X570 motherboards, all of which do support PCIe Gen 4. Now, both of these cards use the new Navi 10 GPU uh, and this comes fully enabled on this card, the 5700 XT. Uh, that means 40 compute units and this is reduced by 10% down to 36 for the 5700. So not a huge, not a huge amount of difference, but you know, uh, it's enough to segment the market. So far, this is the only Navi GPU officially confirmed for the consumer market, but uh, it's, you know, they're not gonna build uh, a whole new architecture just to launch two cards. So it's fair to expect there to be cards definitely below this and possibly above it. But so far, these are the only ones confirmed and these are the ones that we're looking at today. Now, AMD has changed the way that it presents clock speeds on these cards. Uh, and the most important one for you guys is gonna be what's known as the game GPU clock, uh, which is higher on the XT card and about 7% lower on the regular 5700. So again, that's gonna, that's gonna increase the performance gap between the two a little bit more. So that's a very high level summary of the cores. And on the memory, AMD has completely abandoned the uh, HBM memory that it had with uh, both Radeon 7 and Vega 64. It's moved over to GDDR6, exactly the same as this. And in fact, the specifications between all four of these cards is really similar, in fact, the same. So we have eight gigabytes of GDDR6 on these two cards, and it's the same as the 2060 Super and 2070 Super. Uh, you have 64 ROPs, again, on all four, uh, and the same clock speed on the memory, which is 14 gigabits per second, which gives you 448 gigabytes Per second of total available bandwidth. So you might notice in the spec table that the memory bandwidth is actually a little bit down on the flagship part compared to Vega 64, but clearly AMD reckoned that this trade-off was worth it and that the bandwidth they have available to them along with some new color compression techniques is going to make up for it. So if we take a closer look at the cards now, you can see that AMD has moved away from the multi-fan design of the Radeon 7 and back to a more traditional reference design and that applies to both cards. So both of them have a single radial fan and this has a, a closed shroud, and this enables pretty much all of the heat to be exhausted directly out of the rear I.O. panel. Now, pleasingly, both cards are very solid. It's, uh, it's metal used for both the shrouds. Uh, this one we know is an aluminium alloy. I don't know about this one, but it is definitely metal. Uh, this one has obviously been given more attention. It's the flagship part so far. Uh, it has a load of grooves running through it. You get uh, an LED logo along the top edge, and you also get a backplate on this card, and that's something that this card does not have, which I think is a shame. I think, I think nowadays you kind of want to have a card that has a backplate on. Uh, I think it's a shame that AMD has left this one exposed. Now, in terms of display outputs, we have a trio of DisplayPort 1.4 headers and a single HDMI 2.0B. And of course, both cards support FreeSync to HDR. You also get a six pin and eight pin combination along the top edge in the usual place. Uh, and this is plenty sufficient for the TDPs, which are rated at 185 and 225 watts. So that's a brief overview of the physical design of these cards. 
So let's take a look at some benchmarks. So starting with 1080p, both cards are excellent across the board, as expected. Now we see uh, averages above 60 FPS in all of our titles on both cards. And in fact, in half of our games, uh, the minimum is also above 60 FPS. So that's really smooth gameplay. And you can see that in The Division 2, for example. Moving up to 1440p, uh, which is AMD's predicted sweet spot for these cards, that turns out to be true. We see averages above 50 FPS for the XT, slightly lower on the 5700, but still playable in every test. Uh, and both of these cards managed to be playable and smooth in the Metro Exodus benchmark, which is our toughest one. So this pretty much guarantees that you're gonna get a really good gameplay experience at this resolution. Now, as we saw with the super cards, 4K is where the cards start to falter a little bit. This resolution is very, very demanding even today. Uh, so we see like a few of our games where the minimum is below 30 FPS, so you know, literally unplayable. And uh, so if you're gonna play at this resolution, you're gonna have to accept that you're gonna have to turn down the settings a bit. Uh, and we do recommend sticking to 1440p with these cards. Now, card to card, the XT comes out around 10% faster on average across the entire set of games. And with the new price drops that we've just been given, uh, this card is about 14% more expensive now. So it's the 5700, which as expected comes out as the better value card of the two. Compared to AMD's other cards that we tested, uh, Vega 64 and Radeon 7, the Radeon 7 is effectively dead for games now. I mean, it, it's priced very high. It does not deliver enough performance over these two cards. These are gonna be the focus for AMD's high end. Compared to Vega 64, the XT is about 16% faster in total, and the 5700 comes out around 6% faster. So not huge differences there, but you have to remember that AMD is using fewer cores to get there. Uh, the efficiency is way up, and so the improvements are not just in performance. There's a, a whole collection of things that make these cards better than Vega 64. Now, obviously the comparison everyone wants to see is the Super cards versus the new Navi cards. And if we start with 2070 Super, this one has about an 11% lead in our games over the 5700 XT. And a good example of that is in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p, where we see a 77 FPS average here versus 70 here. Now the 11% average figure does disguise a lot of variance between the different games. We remember we are comparing different architectures, so there is variance in how they handle the different codes in the different games. So as an example, if we look at Assassin's Creed and Metro Exodus, we see the variance between these two cards is within 6%, so a good, a good win for AMD there. But if we look at games like The Division 2 and Total War, the lead for Nvidia extends to around 20%, so that's obviously heavily in their favour. So again, it's gonna really depend on the game, the difference that you see between the cards. Moving down the stack, the 5700 versus the 2060 Super. Nvidia does again come out ahead here, but it's only by like 4.5% on average. So really, really close between these two cards. Actually, in some of the games, AMD does actually claim a few victories in the titles where it does better. But something like Far Cry will show just how close these two cards normally are in performance. The new Navi price drops that came in have put the 5700 on par with the RTX 2060 in terms of price. And this is definitely a win for AMD. We see about 10% about performance advantage on average. And we also see that the as you increase the resolution, the advantage for AMD actually starts to grow. So if you're going for 1440p especially, the 5700 is definitely winning against RTX 2060 now. Now we know just from looking at the specifications that Nvidia's cards are rated for 10 watts lower than the competing AMD parts. So we were expecting AMD to consume more power and our own figures do bear that out but it is very close. It is within 10 watts for total system power consumption, so not a huge deal of difference between them. Sadly for AMD, this does, however, mean that Nvidia is still winning on efficiency because remember, these cards are actually a little bit slower and they consume a little bit more power, so that's definitely a win for Nvidia. Now, that's not to say that AMD hasn't made a lot of progress here. The combination of Navi and the new seven nanometer process means that power consumption is way down compared to both uh, Radeon 7 and Vega 64. So this is definitely a good thing and hopefully the Navi architecture continues to develop with this trend in mind. Looking at the temperature graphs now, and again, it's a clear win for Nvidia. Their cards run cooler and the dual fan design also means that they're quieter. That said, AMD does a good job in terms of keeping its clock speeds nice and consistent. The new boosting behavior does mean that there's a lot of micro fluctuations, but we're seeing clock speeds be maintained within like a 20 megahertz window, uh, which is really good. Shows that they're not being too thermally limited. Uh, so for boosting behavior, we saw about 1800 megahertz or so on the higher end card and about 1700 megahertz consistently on the 5700. On the subject of clock speeds, you're probably wondering how these cards overclock. So can you overclock 5700 to the level of the XT? How much room is there in the silicon to go even higher than that? And what sort of efficiency are you going to sacrifice when doing that? 
And sadly, the answer is we just don't know. The driver that AMD gave us for this launch was not ready to do overclocking. It was messing with the power in a way that prevented the cars from responding properly to overclock settings. So unfortunately, we just can't really give you those results until they fix that. And this is really kind of a shame for this launch. This is definitely one of the key elements that you want to test when new silicon comes to market, but we are just going to have to wait and see on that one. Uh, I think this is going to hurt AMD's launch strategy. It is a real shame that they couldn't get it to work in time for launch. So to wrap things up, we've omitted talking about pricing at this point because AMD halfway through our filming decided to drop the price of Navi, which significantly affected how everything looks. So this table is how things are stacking up now. And to be honest, this is a really good move on AMD's part. Before they did this price drop, the cards were looking pretty strong, but Nvidia in playing its hand early has given AMD a chance to respond and respond it has. So instead of sitting in between the two super parts that were launched on Tuesday, the new 5700 XT has now come in line with 2060 super pricing, and it is the faster card. Not often by much, but it is definitely the faster card, so it's immediately applying pressure to Nvidia's new part. Similarly, the 5700 has now put itself in line with 2060 pricing, and this is actually an even better value proposition. We're seeing about 10% more performance on the AMD card than the Nvidia one. Uh, for the same price, so it's pretty hard to argue with that. Now, Nvidia definitely still has some things in its favour. So the efficiency on the supercards is better, the cooler design is definitely better, and it has those ray tracing cores that are going to help out in the small selection of games that actually support that. Nvidia will also have the third party designs arriving sooner than with AMD. I mean, we're talking a couple of days from when you watch this, the third party supercards will be on the market. With AMD, you're going to have to wait until August. The difference there is that for NVIDIA, you're going to be adding money to the cards that are already more expensive than the AMD counterparts. But for AMD, the price drop has actually left a really nice gap in the market for those third party cards to fill. Again, you're just going to have to wait for them though, that's the downside there. Now in terms of buying advice, if I had to point you towards a card right now, it would definitely be the RTX Super cards, purely because they're better built, they have better efficiency, lower noise, lower temperatures, and they have a proven ability to overclock, which as we know, we just don't know where Navi stands right now. But if you are willing to wait, the Navi third-party designs will be here within a month or so. And to be honest, it's really the calling that's holding these two cards back. And these are the areas where the board partners will really be able to improve upon. And by then we should know how well the cards overclock. And that's gonna be another key part of what's going on. If you happen to be the type that likes to water cool your cards, we do know that Alpha Core, EK and Corsair are all planning water blocks and there's probably gonna be more. But in terms of availability, we're not quite sure. Whereas for the NVIDIA cards, you're looking at day one availability just because they're using the older designs. So to finally bring all of this to a close, to be honest, I think Navi is a step in the right direction for AMD. In terms of performance and efficiency, it's gone forward a big deal and it really needed to. And it has some pretty competitive offerings right now. Now, it really is a shame that AMD hasn't been able to get the overclocking and the third party designs ready for launch to really accelerate everything at once. But it has humbled NVIDIA into some pretty significant price drops and shaken up the market. And it's good for the market as a whole. Gamers really do have a lot more better options on the table, and that's largely thanks to Navi. So a pretty strong start for Navi, but it's one that we're gonna to wanna to see the partners build and develop into better solutions than the reference cards. As soon as that happens, we'll bring you the reviews. And in the meantime, we're gonna have some third party super reviews coming as well. So thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.